while many of us, people like me, have had the leisure to work from home. And I know that many of you are actually still going into school and the rest of you are making the best of a remote teaching situation, um, in many cases with kids running around. So a huge thank you to you on behalf of the mayor and behalf um, on, and on behalf of the education and youth team. Um, so I'm really honored to have Naomi Hiscock of um, Primary Science Education Consultancy facilitating the session. And many of you will know Naomi as she's one of the most in-demand experts on primary science in London. So without further ado, further ado I'm going to hand over to um, Naomi. Okay, so um, so this session is about supporting children with leading their own science investigations. In our science lessons in schools, we aim to engage children in science, child-led science. But this is not always easy when we're working with a class of 30 children and also have a list of knowledge objectives that the children also need to be secure about. However, in our current situation, it seems like an ideal opportunity um, to begin to engage the children in independent science inquiry. So, um, as this is something that they will be able to do um, from home. However, children and parents are going to need to be supported with this, um, particularly with asking their questions and then thinking about how they're going to gather the evidence and um, answer these questions. So, this is what we're going to be looking at during this session. We'll think about why it's important for children to engage in child-led science, think about how we can support them with answering their questions. We were going to hear from a school about their project work and how they've shared their project work. Unfortunately, that teacher was a deputy head in a school, so I hope you can understand that his um, priority has shifted um, since Friday's announcement. Um, but I will go through briefly how one this school has done project work and also talk very briefly about the great science share for schools as well. So, first of all, let's think about um, why, what is child-led science? Sorry, what's not happening? Oh, not at all. Sorry, bear with me. Apparently my presentation is not showing, so I need to start presenting it now. I knew there would be glitches in the system. Okay, are you now seeing it? Okay. Um, so, child-led science is really a shift from teachers taking control to the children taking control. A good question to ask in normal circumstances when you're teaching would be, who is making decisions about the inquiry, the teacher or the children? When science is child-led, it's the child that makes the decisions, supported by the teacher. In all our teaching, it's therefore good to stop and reflect on the decisions being made how many decisions am I as a teacher making and how many are the children making? The children need to be making some decisions, otherwise they're not acting like scientists. Learning is not child-led and it's being led by the teacher being the scientist. In our lessons, however, we often feel constrained by the curriculum, bound by the need to cover the key concepts of the national curriculum. It's easy to fall into the trap of guiding them through a process in order to be sure that they get the answers that we want them to get. Child-led science by its nature will sometimes end up with no answers to the question, insufficient evidence to answer the question fully, and on occasions answers to the question that appear to go against expectations. This can be problematic, but if followed up by an evaluation of why the gathered evidence varies and a quick clear demonstration to show the concept, the learning that is taking place far exceeds what would have taken place if the children simply followed a set of instructions in order to get the right answers. In this way, the children are learning to be science scientists. Child-led inquiry also gives the children time to explore questions that are of relevance and interest to them. This helps the children see how science is relevant to them, 
increases their engagement and raises their science capital. But first of all, let's think about what is inquiry. Inquiry is the same whether it's scientific inquiry, historical, geographical or religious inquiry. It's about explaining questions, gathering evidence to answer the questions and then where possible explaining the answers. This is the process that scientists are carrying out all the time. Helping the children to engage in this process helps them to understand in a first-hand way what a scientist does. The inquiry process starts with some stimulus or experience that prompts the children or scientists to think about some questions. For children, this could be exploring some resources, e.g. magnets, electrical components, light sources, that sort of thing. It could be going outside and exploring a habitat. It could be watching a video, such as the What's Going On videos on Explorify. It could simply be sorting the key vocabulary and identifying words they are familiar with, can define or have never heard of before. Once a question has been, once a question's emerged, the next stage is to think about how the question will be answered. What type of inquiry will answer the question? What resources will be required? How will trustworthy data be gathered? How will the data be recorded? Then the data can be gathered, which hopefully will lead to the question being answered. If the question is not answered, this may be because the question was not clearly enough defined or the method and resources were not appropriate. When a question is answered, where possible, it should be explained. However, there are times when children will not be able to explain their findings. The explanation may be too conceptually challenging, in which case simply answering the question is, is appropriate. Sometimes there may not be an answer. This is often the case with patterns there will not be, a, not be a reason. This is often the case with pattern seeking, especially about the natural world. Living things are the way they are simply because that's the way they are. Sometimes completing one inquiry will often lead into more questions and then the cycle goes round and round. So just to come back and think about why should we do child-led science? In summary, it's child-centred, so the pupils can explore the questions that are of interest to them. It involves the children working like scientists. They'll be coming up with their own questions, making decisions about the questions they want to answer, thinking about how they'll set about gathering evidence, and then actually, hopefully, answering those questions. It also develops a range of transferable skills. To complete their inquiry and hopefully answer the question, the children are going to need to plan what they're actually going to do. They'll need to think about the resources that they need, think about how they were going to record their evidence, think about how much evidence they're going to need to gather. This is the planning part. As part of the planning, they're going to be making multiple decisions. As they're gathering their data, they'll probably find that their data isn't quite right, or they may need to start gathering the data in a different way or recording it in a different way. So they're going to involve, it's going to involve using their problem solving skills. Scientists often work as part of a team. Usually under normal circumstances, the children would be working together in small groups in school. They might wish to allocate different team members to different roles like recorder, tester, resources manager. Currently, if the children are working from home, they may also be working with other people, members of their family or remotely with friends. Teamwork will be really important. Another aspect is going to be communications, particularly if they're working remotely with their friends from school. To work with other pe people successfully requires really good communication skills. Scientists also need to be able to communicate their findings clearly to scientists and non-scientists. The more genuine an audience is, the more purposeful this communication is. Sending a report to your teacher feels less significant than sharing your findings with a wider group. The rest of the class, other children in the school, adults and children beyond the school. 
that's where a science fair or the taking part in the great science share can be really, really valuable. It's important that the children are given different opportunities to share their learning in a range of ways. So that all sounds great in theory, but what are the barriers um, for doing child-led inquiry? I'm going to ask you, this is where we go a little bit interactive, I'm going to ask you to think about what the barriers are that are preventing you or other teachers in your school um, encouraging children to do child-led inquiry. You should then be able to put in three words or key phrases that you think are barriers for teachers engaging children in science-led and um, child-led science. I think what's coming through very clearly, I'm sure, as you can see, is that time is one of the biggest constraints because it's the basically this is a free app that anybody can use, um, and it's quite nice for using this CPD with your staff or actually in the classroom. Um, if the word was put in more than once, it gets larger. So we can see that time was the um, factor that people said was likely to be the biggest constraint. Um, questions also is the other one that's come up several times. Obviously, people have put slightly different phrases in, um, but that's coming through quite strongly, which is why this CPD session will be about questioning. Um, Confidence, I think that comes again. Um, hopefully, this, the guidance that you'll be able to give your teachers around um, supporting children to come up with um, questions that they will be able to investigate will hopefully deal with that. Um, resources, we will discuss that. That is something that children should be considering as part of their defining the questions. So I think actually a lot of those things we will be um, covering. Um, the one bit that I think I won't be covering is the safety and the risk assessments, but most of your schools are probably members of CLEPS, and so anything that your pupils are suggesting that they would like to do and you're not sure about, then you should look on the CLEPS website or contact them just to make sure. Okay, that was really quite exciting. I'm quite pleased with the way that worked. We'll try that again later. Uh, thank you very much. So I'm just going to go back to my slides. Okay. Um, somebody did ask a question about whether we'd go through the same process for Key Stage 1 children, the same inquiry process. I would say definitely yes, the children should still, where possible, be coming up with their own questions. They will need guidance and in class activities this may well be... Um, a scenario presented through a story, um, which then you as the teacher would support them with um, defining the question from that. Um, the inquiry process that then follows would be the same, but children will probably be making less decisions initially, um, although they still should be making some decisions, even if it's just a choice between a pipette and a syringe, that is still a choice that they're making. The part that perhaps they wouldn't need to be doing is the explaining part. Much of Key Stage 1 is about making observations and comparing things, um, and they will not necessarily have the knowledge to actually explain those observations. That will start kicking in in Year 3 and Year 4. Um, so I would always suggest before you ask a pupil to explain why, just make sure that you can explain why and that that explanation does fall within the boundaries of the Key Stage 1 curriculum. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, do pop them in on the chat, and we'll deal with those as we go through, if that's appropriate, or I may save them to the end. Okay, so one of the aspects which I just briefly mentioned is that idea of um, getting the children started, um, which could be presenting in a scenario. What you may wish to do is actually particularly at this point in time, um, set a number of challenges. Um, there are a lot of resources out there, and I'm sure if you've been on Facebook, there are so many things out there that teachers are sharing as far as good activities for children to do at home. Um, I'm just drawing your attention to one resource, which are the Crest resources. They're designed specifically to, the, originally they're designed for club activities, 
So they're designed to be run with by busy teachers or TAs or, in fact, parents also run STEM clubs on occasions. Um, so the resources are really easy to manage and use and get. There's two um, sets of resources, the star resources, which are for key stage one, and the superstar resources, which are for key stage two. Each resource comes with an organizer's card, which explains really clearly what you would need to do, what you'd need to think about when delivering the activity, but also the resources that you would need. And there are also activity cards for the pupils. You can see there that each activity starts from a very short story, um, which then provides either a challenge for the children to um, explore or gives them um, the stimulus for a question. They're open-ended activities, but structured. And I think this might be an ideal way of getting children started with the inquiry. So they're not starting with a totally blank canvas. They're getting into the process of thinking about, here I've got a problem or a challenge. What might I do to answer the question? Um, and the Crest Star resources, part of it is also about um, asking them to share what they've been finding, finding out. Um, as I said earlier, there's two, um, two sets of resources, the star and the superstar. As they are open-ended activities, I don't think it would matter whether the children at home are doing the star or the superstar, um, although the content and context are more appropriate for different ages. But bearing in mind, many children may would be working at home um, in mixed ability groups with um, older siblings, younger siblings. Um, I don't think at this point in time it would make any difference. The activities are totally open-ended, so it's the pupils will make what they want of them. Um, if they complete eight challenges, and this might be something that you wish to set as a task over a period of weeks, if the pupils complete eight challenges and all they need to do is um, send something to you or complete their passports online, they can complete the passport to say which activities they've done. Um, they could be in, or they would be entitled to um, gain a Crest Award. This would just give them maybe the little extra motivation to actually complete those eight activities. Um, there is a fee of one pound per student, but the Mayor's London Scientist Project is very kindly subsidising um, a number of um, Crest Awards for schools. Um, you can see the criteria there. If your school meets those criteria, then you would be eligible for um, free or fully subsidised um, Crest Awards. You would have received a voucher um, through the post, but if you didn't receive it or can't find it or think you're eligible, then you can contact the Mayor of London's office. Um, so that would be for the Key Stage 2 pupils doing a Superstar um, Award. So for me, activities like that may be the starting point to support children thinking about the inquiry process. But what we really want to do is then use those as a springboard to further questions, or for them to start thinking about their own questions. Um, I've now totally forgotten why I put that slide up, so I'm just going to flick over it. So here I've got um, some questions which are typical of the sort of questions that children might ask. I'm just going to leave you to look at those first. So some questions are philosophical. <laughs> some questions are philosophical. They can be debated, but not answered. For example, what would happen if the Earth moved closer to the sun? We can think through this using our subject knowledge, but can't actually gather any evidence, um, so we can't actually prove our thinking. Some questions are based on opinions, and again, whilst we can debate them, we can't actually say definitively that we have got the answer. So another the further example might be, should animals be kept in zoos? People will have different opinions on this, so there's not just one answer. What I'm going to do now is I'm just going to, we're going to do a little bit of interaction again. Pop those questions up here. And first of all, are you seeing those questions? 
Okay, so again, if you can go to your Mentimeter and put a different code in this time, I'd like you to think about those questions and think about which questions are philosophical or opinion based and therefore would be interesting to discuss, but we're not going to pursue with any further in science inquiry. OK, obviously, if you still wish to vote, then then please do. Um, that's a really interesting um, graph, which was not what I was expecting at all. <laughs> um, so we will I'll just explore some of these and go through and um, talk about well, my my thinking. Um, but obviously, um, this is a quite an opinion based thing. Um, to me, uh, the ones that I thought, well, certainly the one that I felt was very much opinion based was the should smoking be banned? Um, that will have two different opinions, yes and no. And I'm sure there are people that would um, argue for both sides. So to me, that's an opinion based one. Obviously, it can be better informed by scientific evidence, but still it would be somebody making their decision. Um, the other one that actually I thought was more of a philosophical one, which hasn't scored very highly amongst you guys, was what would happen if there were no gravity. Um, to me, this is something that we can't actually test out, um, or certainly we can't. Um, even going to the moon, we're still not on zero gravity. Um, although perhaps potentially at some point it, it is possible, um, but to me that's certainly one that I would probably leave in the philosophical bracket. Um, but again, it could be informed by better, um, better science knowledge of um, what gravity does, etc. Um, these other ones, we will. I'm going to talk about in a moment. So I'll, I'll leave that and we'll the Mentimeter will store those answers if we want to come back and look at them later. So I'm just going to go back to my slides again. Okay, so there are three things that we should think about and I think some of your answers are based on what we're actually going to talk about next. Um, there are three issues with some of those other questions that you were highlighting as not being ready for science inquiry, certainly. Um, so there's questions like, what is static electricity? Some questions are just too big or too complex for the children to answer. That doesn't mean that they shouldn't be exploring something that's linked to that topic, but they are gonna need support from, from you to actually narrow it down into something that they can actually explore. So rather than what is static electricity, um, asking them to explore does the number of rubs on a balloon affect how many objects it can pick up. So it's very much redefining that question into something that's tangible and the children can explore. The second type, so that's very much a, it's a too, too big a question. The second one is where the question is too vague. Um, and again, I think this is what um, people were picking up on, which is the best grass seed. This is a good question for a teacher to be asking because it's open to interpretation. But for the children to actually explore this, they need to think about what do we mean by the term best. Um, so that question just needs to be tightened up um, so that we've got particular focus and we know what we're actually going to be exploring, which grass seed germinates the fastest. The final question that we've got there um, is actually two questions and children will often do this. They'll often have all their ideas in one question and what we need to do is support them to pull those out into separate questions. So we've got the too big, we've got the too vague and then we've got the too many in one go type of category. So if we just go back to the questions that we were looking at earlier, um, to me, the can we live on the moon is actually just far too big. Um, we might want to think about supporting the children to break this down into smaller chunks. Uh, they could, for instance, think about what do I need to survive? Um, food, water, air, clothing, and then be more specific with some questions such as which seeds, if I want to be uh, if I want to be planting something, which seeds are the fastest to germinate, or if I'm thinking about my clothing, 
which materials are thermal insulators. Why my granny forgets things, um, whilst this is very interesting and maybe going down the why do people what is Alzheimer's, um, we might actually want to think to try and refocus them on memory and ask them to think about whether they can explore whether particular exercises um, will help people with memory or facial recognition, recognition, that sort of thing. Um, so those two, I think, are two, two big questions. Which, what is the best drink? Um, that's one that needs defining. What do we mean by the best drink? Is it the tastiest? Is it the one that's got the lowest sugar? Is it the one that looks the prettiest in the bottle? Um, what does the breed and size of dog, how does the breed and size of dog affect how long it lives? That's an example where we've got two questions in one. So we'd need to separate that out into how does the breed of dog affect the time it lives and how does the size of dog affect the time it lives, although there will probably be a link between those two things. I'm going to come back and talk about where does my cat go at night in a moment. Um, what's better for you playing football or swimming? Again, what do we mean by the term better? And that may be a question that should be broadened out into more types of exercise as well, so that whilst we need to define it, we might need to also open that up a little further. Why does an ice cube melt is a question that the children will probably actually already be able to answer, and it's just a piece of subject knowledge. It's not going to involve doing any inquiry. So again, we might want them to think about, well, what, will, what makes my ice cube melt more quickly or slowly? Um, so the question may be defined as how does the size of the ice cube affect the time it takes to melt? So that just needs um, refine, refining the question. And the last one, how can we protect the planet? Again, I think we're back onto something that is too large and we'd need to think about something much more specific. For example, how much plastic do I use in my family? And can I cut this down over the next month? Um, something like that. So it'd be... Um, a more defined question. Once we've got a scientific question um, that we think the children will be able to explore, we then need to think about, or we need to guide the children to think about how they're going to answer it. And the first thing might be to think about the type of inquiry that they might use. Um, I'm, these are the types of inquiry that are explicitly mentioned in the national curriculum. I won't spend the time going through them now. Um, these particularly lovely little um, posters can be downloaded and there's lots of information about the types of inquiry. Um, so thinking about, so we've got, we've got a question. The children then need to be thinking about whether they can answer that question or whether they need to change their question. So we've got a question and hopefully the children with possibly your guidance will be able to think about what type of inquiry will help them answer that question. Then they need to start thinking about what data will I actually need to gather. If they can't gather the evidence that they need, they'll need to go back to the original. If they can, then they'll need to start thinking about what resources they're going to need. Then are they going to be available? And if not, back again. So I'm just gonna go through the cat example. Um, so let's think about um, the question, where does my cat go at night? This can be answered by an observation over time, but let's think about how we'd gather the evidence. We could try and follow the cats around. That's clearly probably not going to work. Uh, we could attach some sort of ink to the cat that keeps dripping and it leaves a nice trail everywhere it goes. I think we'd need to think about whether this is a responsible approach or not. So at this point, we may actually decide, or the children may, be de may decide that actually, whilst it was a question that could be explored and answered scientifically, it's not a question that they've actually got the resources or a method to actually answer it. So they would then be going back to the beginning and rethinking their question. However, we might suddenly, or the children might suddenly realize that actually maybe we could track the, track the cat electronically. That would give us the evidence we'd need. But then again, we need to think about, do we have the resources? Unless the cat's already chipped and we can track it using some sort of software, 
it's going to be not possible and we probably are not going to be able to buy the resources to do that. So again, we'd need to think about um, re rejigging our question. However, if we've got a monitor and we can monitor where the cat goes at night, we just then need to think about how we're going to get trustworthy evidence. Do we just look at where the cat goes on one night? Do we look over a week? Do we look over a month? Hopefully, at that point, we can feel that we would be able to gather the evidence. We do have the resources. We've thought about how we're going to get trustworthy evidence. We would then need to think about how we're going to record the evidence and then think about how we're going to present it to our broad audience. And this is the part that I'm going to move on and think about now is presenting to a broader audience. Before I do that, because I forgot this slide was here, um, if your pupils have gone through this project um, and they've defined their question and carried out a project on their own, then they've probably spent possibly more than five hours on their project. If they're in Upper Key Stage 2, they could then or they would then be in, entitled to a discovery award, which is £3 per pupil. Um, but again, if you are part of the funding for the Mayor from the Mayor of London, then that could be fully subsidised for the children. So that, again, might be an incentive for the children to pursue one line of inquiry for a longer period of time. Um, there's information there about how to log on to um, the Crest Awards. But it is important that the pupils are given an opportunity to present their findings um, to a genuine audience. Ideally, in the normal world, this would be face to face. Um, but under our current situation, this might be um, much more virtually. Um, if pupils are at home, um, they may well present to the rest of their family. Um, if it's been a home learning project with the whole family involved, it might be that they can share it um, via Skype with other friends and family. It might be that as we set ourselves up in school, um, they may be able to post um, things that you can see as a teacher or other pupils as well. So maybe that you've got some sort of online sharing system that can work. Just very quickly going to talk through how one school um, gave the opportunity for children to share their projects. Um, these are the objectives that that particular school had in mind. Um, and it was the year six pupils that um, carried out projects and then shared them across the school. So the, the teachers supported the children to come up with their inquiry questions. Um, which then the children actually answered um, as part of their um, home learning, their, their homework during that period of time. When the pupils had answered their questions and were ready to share, um, they came back together and looked at the different questions that the children had um, been answering and they tried to put them into categories. They classified them into different groups um, and then the science fair was set up in zones according to those groups. This particular science fair had four zones um, based on those four topics that they identified that all the projects fitted under. Um, so each of the projects was then allocated to a zone of the fair and each project had its own activity station with a table and a display board. Um, the pupils had to have a title for their project. They were expected to do an explanation poster and then, if appropriate, they um, would set up the actual um, investigation on the table in front so that they could demonstrate it. It was important that the pupils um, had practice with their presentations. So the day before, it was, it was all set up in the hall and half the class stayed and were the presenters and the rest of the class visited each of the activity stations. This gave the pupils um, an opportunity to practice their presenting skills and develop their patter, which is really important for the children. Going through things a number of times just means they get confidence um, with their delivery. On the following day, um, each class was allocated a slot. Um, 
in, to visit the fair. Um, so they had a 30 or 40 minute slot. And then the fair was open to um, families afterwards to attend. Each session started by the year six pupils doing a PowerPoint presentation, um, explaining what it was all about. And then the visitors went and visited the stations as they required. Um, what the teacher found really important was to build in time between the sessions so that the pupils could set up their um, stands again, ready to do more demonstrations. Um, there may be questions or if people want to share um, ways that they've run science shares at the end, then we can start sticking that on the chat. Um, another resource that you might want to tap into, particularly if you're running a science fair or doing things back in school once we resume to normal conditions, um, STEM ambassadors can um, support, support you um, with carrying out these projects. They can be there as sounding boards to help pupils refine their questions. Um, they may well also um, be quite interested in attending your great your science fairs um, so that they the pupils have, again have got a broader audience to um, share their work to. Um, and there's details on the slides that will help you with um, locating a STEM ambassador. So finally, I'll just talk very briefly about the Great Science Share. Um, so it's a national campaign to inspire young people to share their science questions and investigations with new audiences. To me, and I think why this fits so nicely with what we've been talking about this afternoon, are those two words. It gives the two pupils an opportunity to share, and it is their questions. So it's pupil-led learning, but with a genuine audience that they can share it with. Um, this will often be set up um, as a science fair, as I've just discussed. Um, but the main thing is that you can sign up um, with the Great Science Share. And actually, the students and the pupils, again, can feel as though they're part of something much bigger. And I think that, again, just really gives it, um, raises the profile and gives everything much more um, of an oomph. Um, what makes the Great Science Share great is that it is child-centred. Um, the pupils will be exploring the questions that they've come up with. It's inclusive. Anybody can join in um, where possible. All the pupils that complete a project would be involved in the Great Science Share in some way. Um, it's non-competitive. There is no judging. It is just about the pupils presenting. It can cross all sorts of boundaries, both within the school, so different age groups, but also beyond the school. So it may be that your parents are coming in. Um, it may be that you invite other schools, um, pupils to come in. So therefore, it's really promoting um, collaboration um, across the school between teachers, between pupils and beyond to other schools and parents. So the Great Science Share happens every year around June. Uh, this one is currently planned for the 16th of June. Um, at the moment, um, who knows what that is going to look like, but there is a commitment to um, the Great Science Share happening. And is Lynn on? Lynn is there, so maybe she might want, I, we can pass over to Lynn if she feels that she's got something to say. Um, but I think we'll just leave it there with just a couple of questions just to finish off. This should be a nice quick yes or no. Okay, so. We have three people at the moment that have been taking part and 11 that haven't. Um, and possibly those 11 may be people that have already signed up for the Great Science Share um, with through the Mayor of London. Um, obviously, again, we that will be up for um, debate as to what's going to happen there. Um, my next question, which is following on from that, is for you to think about if you were to take part in the Great Science Share, which I'm hoping as many of you as possible will now, um, I'd like you just to think about what would be the impact um, on your pupils or on your teachers or on the broader community of taking part. What's coming through really strongly is that enthusiasm, engagement, enjoyment, which I think is, is part of what a Great Science Share is all about. Um, and then there's an awful lot of other things which are great. 
Yes, and I think that focus, focus on inquiry, child-led learning, um, I think trying, being part of the Great Science Share does make us all think about how we are going to push that child-led learning. So it's, it's clear that that's coming through as well. Well, thank you very much. Um, so Liz, shall I hand back to you? How do I do that? Sure. Um, I will just uh, end by saying thank you so much. Thank you, Naomi. That was absolutely brilliant. And thank you, everyone, so much for attending. We're really keen, by the way, to hear from you on, on how we can support you as teachers. Because at City Hall right now, there, there is really an increased focus on primary science and the importance of primary science sort of slowly dawning on all of us. So um, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a lovely evening. Thanks for joining.